Hi everyone, good morning and good afternoon depending on where you are. wanted to welcome everyone to the final session of this season's Clean Tech Nation briefing series. I'm Bryce Yonker and Clean Edge's Director of Business Development and we're very excited to have you all on for this session. We have more than 450 folks registered from over 50, uh, 40 countries from across the world and so it's going to be a very uh, lively conversation. Ron Pernick, our Managing Director, will be moderating today. And just a couple quick housekeeping notes. Everyone here is in listen-only mode, but we do want to capture as many questions as you um, have. So in the question field, which is on the right side of your, your GoToMeeting box, type in any questions that you have. And during the discussion today, Ron or I will be sure to get as many as we possibly can. Also wanted to let everybody know that our uh, Clean Tech Nation webinar briefing series will continue again this next fall with another year of programming. So be on the lookout for various topics ranging from utility clean energy benchmarking to green consumer attitudes and behavior to clean tech market opportunities in Japan. If you're interested in learning more about those partnership opportunities, you can send me a note, yonker at cleanedge.com. Again, we're looking forward to an interactive discussion, so if you have any questions, please enter those. And I'm going to hand it over now to Ron, our managing, my, uh, Clean Edge's Managing Director, who's going to be moderating. Thank you, Bryce, and welcome everyone to today's webinar on 3D printing, clean tech, and sustainability. Uh, as many of you also feel, we believe that 3D printing could turn much of the manufacturing industry on its head, and if done right, it promises cleaner, more efficient manufacturing of lighter, more personalized products with a lower carbon footprint. At the same time, it raises a host of questions and issues, not the least which includes the proliferation of just more junk and toxics laid in feedstock materials in the form of plastics. With us today to help us unpack and better understand all of these issues and more, our biomimicry pioneer noted author uh, and strategy consultant Janine Benyus if you haven't seen her book, Biomimicry, so please get it. Ford Motor Company Rapid Manufacturing and 3D Printing Manager, Paul Susala. Autodesk Global Cleantech Program Lead, Susan Gladwin. And Sustainable Design Expert, Jeremy Saludi. Today's webinar is made possible by our partner and co-host of this series and today's webinar, Autodesk. For years now, Autodesk has been at the forefront of clean tech and sustainability initiatives across the nation and globe most notably through their Clean Tech Partner Program. Uh, you can see here up on the web uh, site, please visit them to learn more about the programs that they're doing at this intersection. Um, so briefly, let me just tell you how today's webinar will work. I'm going to set the stage very briefly with a number of slides. I'm going to offer up four different probing lead-in questions to each of the panelists, so a total of four questions. Then we'll go into moderated conversation. And finally, I will be opening up questions from the audience. We, we like to consider this a very interactive format. So as Bryce said, we'll get as many of those questions in as we possibly can. Please type them into the chat box, and we'll take it from there. Um, so first of all, let, let's just think about 3D printing. I want to set the stage here in terms of the timeline. You know, It's been garnering a lot of media attention and public interest in the last year or so. It's actually been around since the mid to late 80s. Uh, the technology, to those who don't know it well, basically enables companies and individuals to make physical objects from computer-aided design or CAD software by layering successive thin layers of a material feedstock. And as I mentioned earlier, that's most commonly plastic. And as you can see in the timeline here, rapid progress has been made over the last decade or so, with many firsts, including the first working 3D kidney, the first printed car body, we'll learn more about that later, the first prosthetic jaw implant, and the launch of open source collaboration through RepRap and do-it-yourself printing kits from companies like MakerBot. To date, however, most 3D printing has been the domain of rapid prototyping by major corporations, of which we'll learn more about from Ford in a moment, as well as DIY hobbyists. In a sign of the industry's uh, considerable maturation of late, 3D printing company MakerBot was acquired by Stratasys for $403 million earlier this year. I, I also, because we keep stock indexes here at Clean Edge on the clean energy space, I want to quickly show you sort of 
uh, from an investment perspective, what's been happening of late in the sector. Publicly traded 3D printing firms have significantly outperformed the general market of late. Year to date through September 9th, 3D Systems, Organova, and Stratasys, three publicly traded 3D printing companies, have gained approximately 47%, 115%, and 31% respectively, compared to the S&P 17% over the same time period. Similar to clean energy stocks, which, as I said, we track, we expect volatility in this sector. In terms of total revenue or market value, 3D printing is still a small industry, however. According to the research from Waller's Associates, and you can see the diagram here, the total global market for all 3D printing products and services was $2.2 billion in 2012, up a decent cliff, 29% from $1.7 billion in 2011. Um, but to put this in perspective, the global markets for solar PV and wind power were respectively, respectively $80 billion and $74 billion. Uh, in terms of geographical breakout, the U.S. is currently the dominant, in, dominant industrial market at 38%, followed by Japan, Germany, and China, all hovering around 9% of global industrial scale manufacturing installations. So th that's just to give you a little bit of a background of where the market is today. Uh, I, I think it's very clear these are the early days of 3D printing, um, and decisions made now will have a significant long-term impact on the sector's trajectory. That was one of the reasons we wanted to hold this webinar, and, and Autodesk was so supportive. Um, so what I'd like to do now is move over to our panelists to look more closely at this intersection of 3D printing and clean tech, biomimicry, and sustainability, and why this all matters. So we'll begin with Susan Gladwin with Autodesk. Susan, um, for years, Autodesk has played a leading role at this intersection of design and sustainability. And of course, you're actively involved in 3D printing. I'm wondering from your vantage point, how are some of the clean tech companies you're working with, such as Hydrabee, Core Ecologic, which I mentioned earlier, and Socket, using 3D printing to further their sustainability goals and initiatives? Ron, as you mentioned, through the Autodesk Clean Tech Partner Program, we're making millions of dollars worth of our uh, leading design and engineering software available almost for free to clean tech innovators so that they can get their solutions to market faster. Our digital prototyping software is really the engine behind 3D printing, since it's what's used to create 3D models, either from your imagination or by using reality capture technology, where photographs of something that already exists can be stitched together to create a 3D model that can be, then be printed. So thousands of clean tech companies all over the world are in our clean tech partner program. I'll highlight three of those who are undertaking 3D printing as a way to innovate by iterating faster, improving performance, as well as producing their clean technology more cleanly. So first is Hydrabee in the middle of this slide. It's a soda can sized hydropower turbine, which can charge batteries anywhere there is moving water and then in turn charging anything with a USB, including phones and lights, which is especially useful for the 500 million people who currently live off the grid. Everything but the off-the-shelf generator and batteries can be printed. And the team uses the Autodesk software for fluid dynamic analysis to get the most energy out of the flow of water and make the rotor as efficient as possible. And since they can prototype and print new ideas easily, they've been able to change the configuration of the housing model in order to double the amount of batteries that it previously had, thereby doubling the charging power while still keeping it the size of a soda can. That's the kind of thing that pro that kind of quick prototype turnaround allows for. Core Ecologic, as you mentioned, is making the world's first 3D printed car, the Erby. Early on, they realized that the in virtually infinite power of cloud computing combined with digital prototyping to physical print meant that they were able to explore and make new options that weren't physically possible before. They are now modeling version two of the Irby, which will be built of 40 to 50 incredibly complicated parts that could only be made on a 3D printer. It's really become their design foundation. And the sustainability win is that these parts will be much lighter, stronger, and made with less material. They're taking biomimetic inspiration from how bones are made. And they don't have to use old-fashioned casting and steel, which creates huge waste. The other company that I wanted to mention, another clean tech partner, is called Uncharted Play. They're getting lots of visibility for their soccer ball that generates and stores energy, called Socket. And their vision is not just this ball, but a sharing system for power that will include other peripherals. 
they're using 3D printing so much that their head of product development told me that they are coordinating their sleep cycles to the machine cycles. They are literally able to try new ideas on a day-to-day -day basis, simulating them digitally and then testing them physically. They're using the consumer-grade MakerBot printer, which can't yet print foam rubber, but can print the mold that foam can be sprayed into, which is much quicker than a handmade foam prototype. And as they become available, the team will evaluate the, the, the use of biofoam. A key point that 3D print, is that 3D printing lets them print the appropriate volume of models needed for field testing. So it's easy to have one or two prototypes, or thousands once you move into production, but hard to have pre-production units in the hundreds otherwise. And that's really been a breakthrough for them. Enabling production in place is another strategy for uncharted play to make its offering more sustainable. They will move almost all the manual labor to the countries that are the biggest markets for their products, initially to print replacement parts. They're working with MIT Lab to create systems for repairability, which is a key part of designing in sustainability. Ultimately, they envision the creation of decentralized micro factories that will be producing more customized, lower volume products that, because they are better suited to the individual, will generate less need to substitute and replace. So there's lots of other examples, Ron, um, of companies that are thinking about using 3D printing, but these are the ones that are really getting underway that I wanted to feature for, for this talk today. Great, great. And we'll get into more of these later. And to anyone on the call who has not seen these companies, I recommend you check them out. In particular, uh, go look at the socket, because the video they've created for that is astounding, and it very quickly and visually captures what this is all about and why this matters. So thank you very much, Susan. We'll come back to more questions later. Uh, mm -hmm. Janine, um, you've been quite vocal about the promise of 3D printing, if done right, uh, obviously built on materials and processes that are zero waste, circular, and abundant. Uh, I think many folks on this webinar probably haven't necessarily connected the dots yet between 3D printing, clean tech, and biomimicry. So I'm wondering if you can help set the stage by briefly telling us why you are excited about 3D printing and your vision for how it might enable a more sustainable future. Sure, Ron. Um, you know, I've, I see this really as a, an enabling technology um, for biomimicry to happen. Um, when you, and biomimicry obviously is looking to the natural world for um, models for our own, to solve our own problems. So on the left here you have the, you know, the, the, the abdomen of a spider, uh, um, and it's a, a clean manufacturing of fiber at low temps and in water. And then you have, you know, and that's, you know, the nature's manufacturing has been going on for that 3.8 billion years uh, versus our 150 years. So there's a lot of models there. But in many ways it's similar, uh, 3D printing is. Um, it builds, we're building to shape as nature does, so there's a lot less waste. It's distributed manufacturing um, in the same way you have distributed energy. Um, you know, every leaf on a tree is a distributed solar cell, but it's also doing distributed chemistry and manufacturing of cellulose. Um, the what I what I see as the benefits of three um, D printing, if done right, obviously there's a social benefit in this distributed manufacturing, uh, local self-reliant communities, uh, depending on local materials, and hopefully circling them back into the 3D printer rather than the landfill. Um, obviously, designs are crossing the globe rather than products. Uh, three to four um, percent of all greenhouse gas emissions are cargo ships. So to, simply to cut that shipping is, is a big deal. Um, socially, also, there's new jobs for people who um, are able to, to be artisans um, and send their designs around the world. Um, the the fact that that these these um, products are are built to shape with with a lot less waste, a lot of savings in tool and die and molds, uh, no need for fasteners. Uh, you can build in intricate structures. Um, U.S. Department of Energy says you can save 90% of of materials, up to 90% of materials this way, and an average of 50% of energy use, perhaps. Um, of course, on the on the negative side, it could be the industrial revolution deja vu. Um, because uh, you know, m my sense is that un unless we we radically change the way the uh, the sourcing, 
of the materials, uh, where we're getting them from. If we're shipping them in, we've sort of um, um, lost the point. Um, if the chemistry in the printer is toxic, uh, that's an issue, and that's happening. You know, some of the resins being used now come with warning labels that you should wash your clothes after being in touch with them. So you have, you start to have like worker hazards, but it's uh, at home, um, and it's in your neighborhood. Um, you've um, some of the printers are, are extremely high energy, um, and Jeremy will talk more about the differences between them. Um, so yeah, the danger is that we we miss this opportunity to rewrite the story of stuff. You know, we have an opportunity to green the supply chain, to make the chemistry safe, to create a secular uh, return flow for that material, um, and so that's why it's it's important that we're having conversations like this today. Uh, and I'll talk later on about how I think biomimicry is going to fit in 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 making it making it right. Excellent, and thanks for helping us set the stage there and, and really bringing up some of the negative potential ramifications. And as you said, we'll talk later more about what might be a roadmap to, to overcome some of those challenges. Um, well, Paul, you know, Ford Motor Company has been using 3D printing to cut costs and production times. You've been profiled a lot in places like the Wall Street Journal. And you're doing that, you know, through the prototyping phase for everything from your EcoBoost engines to, to other products and services. Um, I'm wondering if you could briefly tell us, and I know it's hard to do this briefly, but sort of set the stage here again by telling us about the types of 3D printing technologies that Ford is using and what you're learning in terms of its impacts on everything from quality to cost to timing to waste reduction, as, as was just mentioned by Janine, and, and then even to being able to design more fuel-efficient vehicles. So, Paul, over to you. Hey, thanks, Ron. Uh, Ford's been into 3D printing since the beginning. In fact, uh, we had the serial number three SLA machine. Uh, fact, Ford has been involved with helping the various companies develop their technologies. Uh, for interest of the sand printing technology that you may have heard of, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, right. Ford found a couple of gentlemen over in Germany working with the MIT patent. And Ford became involved and got a company which eventually turned into be X1 uh, to be able to produce the machine in a reliable fashion. So Ford has five commercial labs worldwide. In my lab here in uh, Dearborn Heights, I have a few different technologies. I have stereolithography, which starts with a liquid photopolymer resin. Uh, I've got uh, laser centering of nylon powder. I've got fused deposition modeling, which is essentially what the MakerBot is. It starts with a filament of material and becomes extruded. And then I have the sand printing technology, where sand is laid down in a uh, casting foundry furon binder is printed onto it to create uh, molds for sand castings. Uh, what we do here in my lab is we basically make all the, or most of the prototype parts for powertrain and for a lot for vehicle. Uh, a lot of castings. We do cylinder heads, blocks, uh, front covers, pans. And that's using the sand printing technology. Uh, in doing so, we don't have any tooling or waste you know, associated with tooling uh, to create the castings. We can print the molds directly. And the nice thing about the 3D printing, whether it be the sand or the nylon or the others, is that if an engineer comes to us and said, well, I've got this design, I think it's what I want, but I've got four more ideas, I'm not really sure where I'm going with it, we can do them all at the same time, you know, very quickly, very efficiently, and he can go off and do his testing. So at the end of the day, Ford gains in the quality and cost and timing department, but also the customer benefits in fuel economy, safety, and reliability. Because the engineer is able to optimize his design before we have to go into production with it. And with regard to waste reduction, uh, many of the technologies only use enough material to make the part. Uh, stereolithography, infused deposition modeling are that way. Uh, the other technologies that end up with a bed of powder or sand the rest of the material uh, can then be either reused, recycled, or sent for energy recovery. Uh, none of our materials actually go into landfill. So overall, Ford is really benefiting from our technologies, uh, not just in my lab again, but uh, worldwide. Excellent. And Paul, just quickly here, could you tell people what we're looking at in these images? Are these polishing after the 3D printing process? I'm just wondering what if you could tell people what they're seeing here. Yeah, over on the left, that's. Uh, parts coming out of the nylon bed from the nylon laser sintering. Uh, basically a box 
comes out of the machine and your parts are embedded in loose powder. It only melts the, the part itself and the rest of it remains loose. So you have to excavate the part, kind of like an archaeologist out of the nylon, brush it off, blow it off, uh, and then your part's ready. That's over on the left-hand side. Yeah. On the right-hand side, those are some sand cores that, again, come out of a large box of sand. What is not printed with the Furon binder remains loose sand. And that gentleman on the right-hand side is brushing the loose sand off of the cores that are going to be sent to the foundry. Got it. And, and in terms of the sand, is it mostly sand, or is there how much is sand, how much is polymer in the mix of that? Do you happen to know? That's all sand. All the sand. sand is, Excellent. The sand is mixed with uh, standard foundry uh, binder chemicals. Uh, you know, the sand has a mild acid on it, and then the, the Furon binder that's printed on top of the sand, where that touches the activated sand, it becomes hard, turns green, that you can see in there. Got it. All right. Thank you. We'll, we'll get into this more as we continue the conversation. Uh, Jeremy, you've been conducting research at UC Berkeley, and you've started to look at the impacts of 3D printing technology. It, really, everything from energy intensity to material toxicity is starting to be finally looked at. Is, as I said earlier, this is the early days, so we need to track this stuff. Um, and I was astounded to see how slow 3D printing times can erase much of the seeming environmental benefit, i.e., uh, longer printing times means more energy usage. So in layman's terms, can you tell us a bit more about what you're learning and how we can accurately evaluate the environmental impacts and other benefits of competing 3D printing technologies against one another as well as against their conventional counterparts? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so like Janine and many other uh, environmentalists, I've been very excited about the, the promise of 3D printing to change the way that we manufacture things and, and you know, hopefully reduce waste a lot and, uh, you know, have various other benefits. But I wanted to see whether the uh, reality matched up to, uh, you know, these fabulous images that we have in our head. Um, so uh, myself and uh, a couple other folks in the team, uh, did a, a full life cycle assessment of uh, two different kinds of 3D printers compared to traditional machining, where you start with a block of material and cut away everything that you don't need. Um, and uh, we found some very interesting things. Um, first of all, 3D printers are not necessarily less wasteful. Uh, their waste is not necessarily recyclable. Um, and uh, But their waste actually isn't that important uh, compared to their electricity use, um, as you hinted at. And, um, and that using 3D printers to eliminate transportation of goods is basically irrelevant, environmentally speaking, although, as you mentioned, it can certainly have social benefits. Um, and, uh, but despite all that, uh, some 3D printers are actually much more eco-friendly than traditional machining, uh, not so much compared to mass manufacture and injection molding, just because of the um, economies of scale there. Um, but uh, what we also found was that it matters much more how you use the tool you have rather than whether it's a 3D printer or a traditional milling machine. So a little more detail on these. Um, there's a bunch of different kinds of 3D printers, as, um, uh, as Paul mentioned, and the fused deposition modeling that he talked about, uh, FDM, is actually almost zero waste, um, as long as you don't need any support material. And those are great. And, and those actually have the lowest impact of the ones that we measured. That's the bar over on the left-hand side of the graph here. Um, and uh, But the inkjet printer that we measured uh, it actually wastes about 40% of its polymer ink in addition to the support material used. Um, and today, none of that waste is recyclable. Uh, but there's, you know, different kinds have different amounts of waste and, you know, give you different opportunities for what to do with the waste, as Paul was talking about. Um, but then the larger point is whether the waste even matters that much. Um, the, the graph there, um, it doesn't break down eco-impacts by where the impacts come from. Um, I have that data, but I can't put that out in the world until the journal article is published. But uh, for the tra traditional machining, uh, the material use and waste is actually the largest impact. But for 3D printing, it's the energy use. Um, the materials do still matter. They're just not the biggest slice of the pie. 
Um, and there's, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in this data as well, depending on how you use these machines, what materials you use, where you get your energy from. Uh, that's why the tops of all of these graphs uh, don't end in a nice sharp line, but have kind of a blurred out uh, top. That's just to give you a visual indication of the uh, amount of uncertainty going on there. Um, and, uh, and the graph shows um, that uh, we found the FTM machine to be best, but the inkjet machine was actually worse than traditional um, uh, milling machines. But uh, what's not shown in the graph is that um, utilization of the machines matters far more than what kind of machine you have. So making one part per week and leaving the machine on the rest of the time uh, can have a, about 10 times the environmental impact per part as making parts constantly 24-7. And that's true for all three of these machines. And so that factor of 10 difference is way bigger than the difference between using an FDM versus a milling machine or using an inkjet 3D printer versus a, a milling machine. So, Excellent. Yeah. Jeremy, I, I know that you did a nice short overview on this in a Green Biz article that people can track down. You mentioned this longer journal piece. When is that likely to come out, and can you tell us the journal? Uh, well, so I've submitted it to the Journal of Rapid Prototyping. Um, unfortunately, the academic publishing world is really, really slow. So um, at best, it'll probably be out about a year from now. Okay. But, um, but yeah. Well, we'll all keep a lookout for that so we can see the results of that research in, in deeper detail. I know I'm sure a lot of people in the audience would love that. Um, so I, I'd love to move on. Oh, that was a great stage setting by all of you. Um, I want to remind everybody that we are taking questions, so please send those over. My colleague Bryce Yonker will be gathering those and sending them over to me. Um, Susan, I, I'd like to kind of come back to you for a second, and, and you've got to talk about some of these companies that are using 3D printing for their sustainability initiatives. And, and you know, it seems to me that perhaps uh, the advantage of 3D of printing could apply equally to other sectors as, as well as clean tech. I'm wondering, in your view, what are some of the things that perhaps make clean tech or biomimicry a bit different? Sure. Um, well, certainly clean tech is, is going to be using 3D printing as any other company would in, 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 the basic, in terms of the basics of how they're using it to, to do the actual printing and so forth. But I think it's about what clean tech is trying to do, which makes it especially useful for clean tech because Companies who are in clean tech, as everybody pretty much on this audience I'm sure knows, um, they're, they're often smaller companies who are doing the, the, the most innovation at the cutting edge. They have very limited resource, resources, but really enormous ideas. And they're really trying to change the world for the better. So they're driven to prove and commercialize their, commercialize their ideas with a great sense of urgency. Um, so the, the ability to do this digital to physical prototype is really important for them, being able to test test the models, um, simulate, analyze, visualize, all that kind of stuff, and ideate and use the cloud all before they make it real, but then be able to you know, turn it into something real very quickly and, and, and get into that prototyping is, is really essential for them. And further, I think the other, another thing about clean tech is their mission. They're, you know, they're mission-driven. They're purpose-driven companies, and that they won't really settle for good enough when it comes to optimizing for a positive impact. Um, so in trying to shift the paradigms, whether they're working in energy or transportation or, or buildings or water or whatever, they often need to create something totally different. So they're, you know, whereas a lot of today's 3D printing applications are based on replicating existing stuff that's already there, just now you can print it at home, um, clean tech is really trying to optimize and create something completely new, which means things that couldn't be made otherwise, as, as I was talking about. So those, those are some of the things. And then the third point is, um, this notion of crowd crowdsourcing and mm. clean tech, especially some of these companies I talked about, but others too, they're finding a lot of success in crowdsourcing funding. And I know some of these companies, these three I mentioned, are, are actively underway with that, or will be shortly. And then they're also able to crowdsource design, like Janine said. You know, we're sending designs, not products. So they're they're able to tap the global community of designers out there to help help them further innovate. And that's that's especially exciting. Well, that's an interesting point. I mean, the core ecologic, core ecologic for the RB2 is using crowdfunding, and I saw with the socket the same thing. The way you buy that is sort of through a donation. So lots of interesting models and 
leveraging the web to, to, to get support. Um, Paul, I, I'd like to move over to you for a second about just sort of, you know, we look at some of these earlier stage companies, you know, Core Ecologic saying, you know, did the first 3D printed car body, looking at the 3D printed car. Obviously, you're looking at using it for rapid prototyping and have been doing that, as you pointed out, for years. I, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what might be on the horizon in the view of Ford in terms of actual consumer application. So, you know, a lot of people have talked about this vision of a future where customers could print up their own replacement parts. We'll probably talk about that more. And, and there are lots of other ideas that are out there. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about Ford's view on, on that type of, of application and, and those developments. I probably can't speak uh, directly on Ford's view, but I can give you my view. That'd be uh, great. What I think is going to happen is, you know, eventually you're going to be able to print parts uh, for different applications. Uh, some of the stuff you uh, it's going to take a long, long time if it ever is able to be manufactured by the end users. You know, safety components, suspension components, that type of thing. But I think there will become a day where you might go into a dealership or another. Uh, company and say, you know, I want to customize my car, I want different ground effects, I want a, a wing on the back, I want uh, the interior to have these different features. You might be able to actually go in and design this stuff with, uh, you know, a salesman or somebody and then have it printed and installed on your vehicle. I think that's probably not too far away. You know, I think there's other applications too that, you know, in a non-safety critical uh, aspect of the vehicle, if there's something that breaks, yeah, then we may be able to allow somebody to print a part if it, uh, you know, is just a, a feature of some type, right, instead of, uh, again, we can't let anybody do their own safety work, but if there's, a, I don't know, a glove box breaks or something, you know, maybe we can let, you know, allow somebody to print the, uh, you know, the inside of the glove box. That shouldn't be an issue, I wouldn't think. Well, yeah, and you could also imagine Ford approved copy centers where people could go and tap the CAD design and then print out the part and take it home. Absolutely. So, yeah, lots of interesting things there, and hopefully we'll get to talk about it more. Um, I, I want to go to Janine now, and then I'll, I'll start opening up the questions. Anyone can comment on any of these questions on the panel. It's, usually we have three panelists today. We have four, so just speak up and, and let us know who you are. Um, but but Janine, one of the things that I saw, and you've been writing about this more recently, you've been recorded on the web talking about this at some interesting events, and and you talked about how there are only a handful of, of polymers in the natural world, I think around five major classes. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love it if you could just walk us through some of those classes and you know what is you know from a biomimetic, from a biomimicry model or point of view, how could practitioners start to maybe tap into that type of model where we don't use, you know, 350 different polymers and, you know, toxic uh, material sources and start with a smaller palette that's recyclable. So I just love your thoughts on that and, and what could we learn from nature? Sure. Um, that's the most exciting thing for me, I think, is that we have this opportunity to uh, do what nature has done, which Really, um, if you look at biomaterials in the natural world, you, you really do have a handful of polymers. I mean, for instance, you've got keratin, which you're going to find in everything from feathers to skin to hair. It's a very, very common compound. So is chitin. I mean, that's what you find in all ec insect exoskeletons. You find in, in crabs and crustaceans. Um, these, this small material palette um, that nature uses to create an incredible diversity of designs um, that allows recyclability. Um, whereas, you know, in, in the natural world, when when an organism like a beetle wants to um, create new functions, it simply changes the structure of this common material. When we often want a new function, we'll create a whole new polymer, a whole new kind of plastic, uh, which gives us recycling problems. Um, so, for instance, the beetle, you know, the chitin, um, if you lay it up in a plywood hatch, uh, you're going to get uh, strength. If you put nano bumps on it, you're going to get water resistance. So, you know, water's going to beat up and, and, and go off. If you lay it up in a particular, the transparent layers, the last few layers, it'll play with color to create structure, uh, to create uh, color. I'm sorry, the structure will play with light to create color 
called structural color. Mm -hmm. So structure is uh, design um, is added to matter, very simple um, handful of polymers. Uh, and we can do that now when we're talking about a, a build file in a computer. We're able to give it whatever structure we want. But the, but the key thing is going to be to keep that material palette simple so that we don't have you know, it's the, the the dream is to have you know your Napa store where you walk in and you you know you've got five printers instead of a warehouse of goods behind you, right? A warehouse of of parts. We could get into the situation where we have a warehouse of raw materials, and we want we want to think carefully. I think about keeping those that raw material palette small and adding design to it. Put the complexity in the printer in the build file of the printer. Excellent. Excellent. Um, no, Ron, Jeremy, I, I, I'd like to go back to you a little bit on some of the research you did, and and I'm interested in a, a lot of people talk about the benefits of you know really bringing the manufacturing closer to the end consumer. So whether that's you know at their home, at their office, as I mentioned earlier, at a local copy center. In your analysis, and again, I, I assume this analysis will change, or the analyses will change as printers develop and become more efficient, but how much of a product energy intensity and even sort of the carbon emissions related to that related to the shipping process and the storing process? Is that something you looked at? Is it significant or, or not so much? Um, we did look at that, yeah. And, um, and actually, that is one of the things that is not really going to change much by different kinds of 3D printers. Um, it's just that for most products that you uh, that you use, um, the, tr <clears throat> the uh, environmental impacts of transportation are just not a very big slice of the pie. You know, m for for many products, they're uh, a few percent of the of the total life cycle impacts. You know, whereas uh, compared to say uh, the energy use during the life of the product, if it's something like a laptop or a, a light bulb or um, the materials used in the manufacturing, if it's a cell phone, um, you know, or kind of any piece of electronics, the uh, um, it's the it's the um, impacts embodied in the materials and then the energy use of the product, um, and then even things like uh, furniture, which are uh, much simpler material-wise and that don't use much energy during their mm -hmm. lives, even even then um, the transportation impacts are, are a very small slice of the pie. Same with food as well. Um, so that's something that's not really going to change. Yeah, that's um, interesting. And where are the biggest impacts to be had, do you think? Uh, well, so it's, uh, it's more on the materials and on the energy use. And so with 3D printing, the place that it can help is it can reduce the amount of materials used in things. Um, as, as Paul mentioned, you can, uh, you can print out, or, or um, maybe it was uh, uh, Susan, I, for, I forget who said it anyway, mm -hmm. but um, uh, you can print out parts that are 90% hollow uh, by having little interior sort of scaffolding structures right. or, or trabeculated like bone um, rather than being solid. And, um, and interestingly, with the 3D printers that, that we looked at, um, your, your main benefit there is actually not even the material savings because the materials are not a big uh, percentage of the impacts of the 3D printer, but because having a mostly hollow part lets you print the part out faster. Uh, you use less energy while you're printing it. That's really interesting. And I know we all talked earlier when we were getting ready for this panel, and, and I think this whole thing kept coming back in a lot of ways to you know, breakthroughs in materials. We're starting to get questions from the audience. So one of the things I love what people are asking for is what are some examples of perhaps bio-based materials or, or recyclable and recycled feedstock materials. So I'll just open that up to everybody, but um, is anyone finding some interesting stuff that we should uh, mention or talk about uh, and sort of point out to the folks that are in the audience? Yeah, Ron, I, this is Susan. Um, one company I did want to mention is Mango Materials. Right. They're, they're making um, bio-based materials, like truly bio-based materials, not, not something that's sort of a composite. And we're working on a study at Autodesk to quantify the kind of impacts that Jeremy's talking about, kind of for, take, see, see how that applies in our realm, and, and so we can support more sustainable approaches. And, and we're working with companies trying to understand where, how we can best optimize for more 
a more bio-based approach. I'm curious what Janine's perspective is on something like a bio-based material, if, if that's viable from a... Well, you know, there's, there's two ways we can go. One is to um, divert waste materials, say, from agricultural residues, something like the chitin I mentioned, mm -hmm. the exoskeleton, um, that could come from seafood waste. That's one way to go. What I really don't want us to do is to start growing crops for plastics. Mm -hmm. I think that would mm -hmm. be, I think that would be basically mining soil instead of mining oil because it's got a, the fertility. You know, you're, you're pumping that fertility out of that soil, and so there's a, we've got to really be careful. I think the most promising thing, um, though, though it is, uh, there's there's pilot plants being built now, but it's not yet. Uh, widely, massly commercialized, but it is CO2, carbon dioxide, yep. to stuff. Yep. Right. So Novomer in Ithaca, um, making polycarbonates, PE, polypropylene, that are 50 percent weight by weight CO2. Uh, Bayer is getting into this as well, building a pilot plant. Now, to me, that's that's what plants do. They take CO2 and they turn it into stuff with solar energy. And the stuff is cellulose, starches. And, and we could be taking uh, CO2 um, and um, splitting water with, with solar uh, to, to, um, to get the hydrogen and, and creating um, fuels and also creating materials out of CO2. I, I really think that while it sounds like science fiction, I think we should try to accelerate that. That's true. No, it's a great a great point. This whole idea of carbon as a feedstock, and yep. you know, people have tried it before. Uh, you know, it's been happening a bit in in the world of cement, and and I love these the example of Novomer, and I didn't know what I don't know what Bayer is doing up intimately, but that'd be great for people to track that. Are there any other companies that people know? I, again, the audience is sort of asking for actual examples, so that's great. We mentioned Novomer, Bayer, Mango Materials got mentioned. Are there some other? Uh, breakthroughs that people know about on the materials front? Well, um, one thing that I would like to mention is not just the materials, but how they're bound together. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of these machines, uh, they, they bind things together by having a polymer or a, or a metal that they melt or fuse together. Uh, but there are some machines that use uh, basically glues instead. And um, I, I can't remember the name of the company offhand, but there's at least one working uh, with basically sawdust as a, um, as a material and then uh, bound together with a, with a glue rather than having to use all this energy to melt things or fuse things together. Um, and I think that has a lot of promise. And obviously, you would want to use uh, non-toxic and ideally even biodegradable uh, glues um, so that you could put, uh, create a 100% compostable uh, product in this way. Yeah, and, and in that example you just gave, I believe, were they making furniture? Is that correct? Um, the things that I saw were more little handheld products. Um, okay. There are also companies uh, making furniture out of um, biomaterials like that. I'm not aware of companies that are 3D printing, um, but uh, I'm, they're, they're very well maybe. And, and, and Jeremy, we, we talked briefly about Marcus Kayser's solar center project. And it's a little different, but where he's taking sand and turning it to glass with solar power, with actual renewables. Could, could you tell the audience just a little bit about that? Because I thought it was an interesting example of, of a potential breakthrough. Yeah, actually, um, he's probably my favorite green 3D printing example anywhere. Um, he is, uh, I believe, an Italian guy um, who went to the uh, the Sahara Desert with this rig that he made um, that is a uh, 3D printer um, that uh, basically he scoops up sand uh, from the desert, pours it into his machine, and the machine uses a giant lens on top to just take sunlight itself as the uh, as the energy use um, as sorry as the energy source to fuse the sand together into glass. Um, and then he also has a little solar panel on there that runs the motors and the electronics and stuff. Um, but it's mostly just the sunlight 
getting focused through a lens uh, that fuses the glass together. And so it's it's uh, it's it's sort of dream manufacturing. It's totally self-contained, 100% renewable energy, non-toxic local materials, uh, just completely brilliant. Excellent. And, you know, so to, a number of people are asking. Go ahead, please, Janine. Well, you know, when you think about glass, you say, well, that's going to be very brittle. And this is where structure comes in. Um, Marcus Bueller at MIT is looking at um, glass in the natural world. One of, one of the glass um, skeletons is the skeleton of the diatom. Very, very small organism. But it's got a structure that makes, it ex makes that glass extremely impact resistant. Or layered glass, uh, layered in a certain way that that nature would have it um, to, to give it that robustness. So when you add, when you take something like Jeremy's talking about and then add structure to it, um, you can use one material and make it, make it non-brittle. Got it. Um, I, I have a question here about PLA, um, which is commonly used in, in a number of different 3D printing machines like MakerBot. Um, and because that's plant-based, that kind of goes into your issue uh, earlier that you mentioned, Janine, that you don't want to grow more plants. But it, it, do you see a, a way to take PLA and, and you know, recycle it, uh, compost it? I mean, there's been a whole bunch of issues around that. But I'm just wondering, is that a solution, or is, is that really not going to play out here in terms of the PLA-based materials? Jeremy, is that you something know, you've looked at, or Janine? Well, I'll let Janine go first. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's basically corn corn based. It's it comes yeah. from corn, so it's got a lot of these legacy issues of industrial agriculture. Um, I think you know, looking at waste, cellulosics, um, that like I said, that that um, the the energy to create corn and in industrial agriculture sort of erases the the. Um, Yes, yes, it can be compostable in the right conditions, but I'd rather the feedstock uh, not be corn. Uh, I, in fact, would rather, I, I, you know, these biodegradable plastics from CO2 actually are sure. us standing in as the corn plant, right? So yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it's an interim solution, but I see a slippery slope there uh, as, as that's scaled up. Well, suddenly, we'll, we will be growing for uh, plastics, and that's, that's not yeah, where we want to Jeremy, did you want to add into that at all? Um, well, yeah, I, I agree with Janine that it's uh, it's an interim solution. There are other materials uh, that are in the works that uh, that could be much better, um, and uh, and and stuff that we haven't even started creating that could be far better. Um, but uh, but in terms of the options that are available today, uh, it's definitely one of the best ones um, because even though you know, it does have the, the problems of using uh, agricultural uh, materials, like Janine said. Um, it is less energy intensive than um, the alternatives that you would be using for a, a 3D printer, which is ABS plastic. And it's also less toxic mm -hmm. than ABS plastic. Um, yeah, what some people might not be aware of is that, uh, you know, with your 3D printer running, um, you are melting this plastic in your office, and so you can actually get some uh, toxic, um, uh, you know, little tiny particulates of uh, of material floating around in the air that are not good for you to breathe. Um, and uh, and PLA is significantly less toxic than uh, ABS, which is sort of the the standard uh, feed source before PLA became so popular. Um, and PLA also, because it has a lower melting point than ABS, it uh, it uses less energy in the 3D printing. So, so it is definitely um, a good option for now of the you know of the choices that we have. Um, but uh, but there are much better choices coming down the road, and we need more people developing even better options than we have. Got it. Um Paul, you, you got to address some of this in your opening remarks, um, but I'd like to come back. You know, we've looked at the material side. We're talking about some of the material, you know, feedstock materials that one might use. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit more. I want to go back to this waste reduction side. I mean, I think it's very interesting the the, the manufacturing of, of a more hollow product. Um, 
Could you tell us a little bit more about the type of waste reduction uh, advances or advantages you're finding with 3D printing uh, in your uh, applications? Well, again, you don't have, uh, you know, depending on what parts you're making, you don't have a lot of tooling involved in the machining of the tooling to create the parts to begin with. So all you're doing is creating the part. The rest of the processes are gone. Um, like if I wanted to make, uh, say, an intake manifold, the traditional method would be to injection mold the intake manifold. We would have to go out, make injection mold tooling out of uh, some type of a metal, whether it be aluminum or steel. Uh, take that out, have it uh, shot. There would be a lot of waste in the uh, production of that part. Even each individual part has gating in that on it that's going to be thrown away. The intake manifold that we produce here, all you're getting is the intake manifold, period. That's the only thing that comes out of the process. There's a little bit of powder around the part that uh, gets recycled back into the machine. Uh, where We can recycle a lot of that powder today, and we continue to work on increasing that recyclability. Uh, what we can't uh, recycle goes for waste recovery, energy recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So uh, same thing Great. with the, the fan casting stuff, same idea. Great. So lots of breakthroughs, obviously, on that waste reduction side and the material feedstock side. Susan, I, you know, we've talked a little bit about some early stage companies. We, we've talked about the, some of the large corporate activities. And of course, there's this huge, and Janine and you both intimated at this, but you know, a huge, huge sort of DIY aspect to this. And with your activities in that, re, you know, with, with the maker movement and, and instructables.com, just wondering if you could talk briefly about how you're seeing this role of the DIY community at this intersection of, you know, really this very democratic manufacturing uh, era that we seem to be entering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right, and it's it's kind of the beginning of a, a new phase of a lot of great innovation, and we're just seeing the beginning of of how that's going to make a difference. Um, it's really like we've been talking about the combination of easy to use digital prototyping software with with 3D printing. It gives anyone with the you know an idea the ability to make it, and then on a website like Instructables, which which we acquired, we you can tell other people about how to make it. So, you know, it's it's a great the DIY DIY community is really a great proving ground for new ideas. We're starting to see things 3D printed clean tech, for example, a solar powered 3D printed boombox, a 3D printed LED flashlight, or some projects that are up on Instructables. Um, we especially like the 3D printed rain barrels because they suggested that the option of upcycling, upcycling existing two liter soda bottles for the barrels and then printing out custom connectors to create the, the system. So it's that kind of ingenuity that's really fertile ground for optimizing for the best solution that's based on a hyper-local, perfectly customized printed piece. So that, that, that's really, I think, where we're going to see a lot of innovation coming. Great. And, and sort of a huge open, you know, you talked about crowdfunding, but a huge open source component to this with the, mm -hmm. the sharing of, as Janine said earlier, of designs uh, rather than the actual products. Um, yeah, I, I, we're getting some great questions, and obviously we're butting up against the end of our time, but I want to get a few of these in. One that I found really interesting that just came in is something that I've been reading about, which is this whole issue that with 3D printing, usually it seems like today, you're kind of limited to one material in the process. So what kind of breakthroughs need to happen to have multiple materials 3D printing? Is anyone on the, the call familiar with that and talk a little bit about what needs to happen to use multiple materials in a 3D printing process and, and what that's going to look like? Well, actually, there are already machines that can print multiple materials at the same time. The, uh, the inkjet machine that we measured is, uh, is one of those uh, machines. Um, and, uh, you know, right now, all the different things that it uses are, are different flavors of polymer ink, basically. But there's no reason that you couldn't extend uh, that to a wider scope of materials, in theory, in a, in a different kind of machine, um, particularly if you're binding things together with, uh, with glues, you know, um, non-toxic adhesives, rather than melting them, uh, because then you, uh, you have a much wider palette of things that can be stuck together than things that are compatible to melt together. Do you envision a, a, a lower cost? I don't know how expensive those machines are, but sort of the price is coming down, so that becomes more accessible to do multi-material printing? 
Um, yeah, I mean, there's going to be a Moore's law for that, just like there is for any other piece of technology. And so I couldn't tell you off the top of my head you know, what the time scale of that uh, progress would be. But, uh, but yeah, it'll, it'll definitely happen. Uh, another question that's come in from a number of people is sort of where are the hot spots for 3D printing today? And obviously this is very dispersed and distributed, but are you seeing any geographic regions really start to uh, come to the forefront in terms of where a lot of 3D printing innovation is happening? Anybody on the call who might be able to answer that? Okay. Well, let me move on. We, we, I want to wrap up here with what I think is one of the most in, important questions for everybody on this call. Um, um, what? Ron, I, I'll just comment really yeah. quickly. I think that oh, sure. 3D printing, I mean, just conceptually, is that it's so decentralized that there maybe there is, there aren't really hot spots. I mean, I'm sure there are if you did some analysis, but it can happen anywhere, and and I think that's part of the the idea is, in the, and we know, for I know, for example, India is ramping up a lot on 3D printing, and we talked about Socket, who's doing work in locating 3D printing in Africa and so forth. So I think, I think it's that decentralization that's actually an exciting part of, of it. Of course, a lot's going to build around the kind of Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley equivalents, just because of that nature of those ecosystems of round innovation. But certainly, it's going to be more and more decentralized, I would think. Right. Absolutely. I, I would I would agree, and I would say that that it, that's it's right now. Um, it's a good thing, but it's it's also the fragmentation is one of the things I think we need to solve right now as we're thinking this through. Yeah. Um, we're working on at Biomimicry 3.8 getting grants to actually create a roadmap and pull together a network of people who um, who can think this through. Um, so you have everybody from the supply chain to the re reverse logistics folks in the room together um, mapping out the systems map and where we might intervene in that system to make sure we make this safe and cycl cyclical. And yeah, cyclical. excellent, because that was a segue to my final question, which is how do we roadmap this? What's the research agenda and how do we bring all these disparate players together from engineers to entrepreneurs to CAD designers? So. Um, Janine, you're, you're saying that Biomimicry 3.8, which people can go Google and find, is, is starting that dialogue. I saw you gave a talk at, at the Circular Economy uh, yeah. event. Uh, is that another place where that dialogue might happen? And, and then to everyone else on the call, as we wrap up here, uh, where are some other resources that people can go to so we can keep this conversation going? So Janine? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the event you saw me at was the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, they worked with McKinsey on a great new circular economy report. And um, now they're coming out with a 3D printing um, um, chapter of that, uh, the next chapter of that. And we, we are planning to work with them to try to pull together um, the, the key folks in, in four parts, in, in the sourcing, in the printer chemistry, uh, where are the build files going to come from, uh, these biomimetic build files? How do we take nature's designs and catalog them and make them available to people through Autodesk software and other kinds of software? And then the reverse logistics. Um, it's, it, it is time to get everybody in the room. Well, let's do it. Does anyone else have anyone, uh, any other groups to point out before we wrap up today? Excellent. Well, let's plan to keep the conversation going. Um, this concludes today's webinar. I hope you've all enjoyed it and found the conversation as helpful and informative as I did. I'd like to thank Susan, Jan Janine, Paul, and Jeremy for their time this morning and really for very you know, valuable insights. I'd also like to thank our webinar co-host, Autodesk, for making this webinar possible. Please note that this webinar has been recorded, and our plan is to post a link to the website later today or tomorrow. In coming weeks, we'll also be updating our website with information on upcoming webinars in the second season of our Clean Tech Nation briefing series. So with that, thank you all again, and thanks to our panelists. Have a good day.